Welcome to today's webinar on fluorescence guided surgery, solid organs. And it's my pleasure to introduce your speaker, Dr. Luigi Boni, a professor and chief at the Department of Surgery, IRCCS, Polyclinico Hospital at the University of Milan. Dr. Boni, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, let me thank uh, Daniossi Green for organizing this uh, interesting series of uh, webinar uh, that allows everybody to understand the principle of fluorescence guided surgery and the potential of fluorescence guided surgery as well. My topic today is going to uh, focus mainly on the use of fluorescence guided, or, uh, guided surgery uh, for the perfusion of organs, mainly solid organs. You will have, I saw the program for the future, you will have session regarding endocrine surgery and liver surgeries that will go probably deeper than what I'm gonna do it on this field. But I think it's very important that you actually, you are able to have a, a, a general uh, information regarding this kind of procedure. Well, first of all, uh, for those of you that did not uh, follow the previous uh, webinar, uh, what is all about? What is fluorescence guided uh, surgery all uh, um, about? Well. Actually, is uh, it makes uh, uh, and fulfill a dream of uh, most of the surgeon that uh, allow the surgeon to see what stand what, what with standard light with normal surgery is basically invisible. So you are able uh, with fluorescence guided surgery to see what is not usually visible when you use standard light, both in open and laparoscopic uh, surgery. And this is uh, based on a very simple uh, principle if you want uh, the principle is uh, having a dye uh, that are chlor called fluorophore that uh, usually is from totally invisible but this dye can be excited by means uh, of different sources of excitement uh, either near infrared uh, um, uh, light or laser beam according to the uh, system that you're going to use it and when it is excited the fluorophore gets uh, very uh, gets fluorescent and the fluorescence that uh, you release can be detected by the use uh, of a special camera so is is a matter of fact that is a very simple uh, technology uh, there are different ways to administer uh, the dye uh, and there are different ways also to see the dye according to the, uh, to the procedure that you want to do it. Just bear in mind that uh, uh, at least until a few months ago, uh, the only dye that was uh, uh, clinically available uh, for human use uh, was uh, indocenin green and 5-LAA. Uh, um, uh, uh, 5-LLA, uh, we're not going to talk about this uh, today because it's a, it's a different uh, uh, principle and indeed, uh, actually, even in terms of cost, is a little bit more expensive. It's much more expensive than Indocin in Green. Uh, and in the future, there will probably come out a new flow for. There is a lot of university, a lot of companies that are now uh, studying new fluorophore that have a, a little bit different metabolism from uh, indocenin green. And just to, to show you and to have fun, remember that a lot of things in life are fluorescent. This is, for instance, is the spike of the circular stapler from one of the major companies that we currently use it. And this spike under near infrared light, it does became fluorescent. So the, the, the material of the, of the color that they use it, it actually, it is uh, fluorescent. As I mentioned, to date, the most uh, uh, surgeon that use fluorescent, that are involved in fluorescent guided surgery, uh, they use this dye, indocenin green. Indocenin green is not uh, a very recent fluorophore. Uh, basically, it was developed during the Second World War by the Kodak Laboratory uh, to perform uh, uh, fluorescent photography. And then in 1957, 1960s, their uh, ICG was tested uh, at the Mayo Clinic for two purposes. One, to evaluate the liver function, and two, to perform a geography of the retinal vein. Why to evaluate the liver function? Because uh, ICG is uh, a molecule that once it's injected IV, is uh, uh, excreted from the human body exclusively through the bile. And hence, uh, if the liver has a good function, the elimination of the uh, ICG from the bloodstream is very, very quick. 
in a, and within a 10 to 15 minutes, you should not have any ICG left in the bloodstream. If the liver it doesn't work very well, this elimination is much less and it takes much longer. And the function, probably you, you follow the previous uh, webinar, the, this characteristic of ICG can be used to perform fluorescent cholangiography uh, and to help you doing laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Uh, ICG is an excellent uh, product because it's not metabolized by the human body. You inject it, it doesn't really change, and is excreted through the bile. Um, the toxic dose of ICG is extremely high. Um, I, I calculated once with my resident that you need to give the patient a couple of liters of ICG just to have a little bit of uh, uh, side effect of intoxication from ICG. And usually uh, you use one or two cc, so it's a very safe uh, um, uh, fluorophore. And uh, uh, ICG um, does contain, in most of the producers, uh, contain a little bit, a tiny little amount of iodine. So it's technically contraindicated in uh, uh, pregnant women or people that have an allergy uh, to iodine or people that have a uh, um, uh, thyroid problem. The amount of iodine though that is in the powder of the ICG is very, very limited. And the uh, adverse advent that has been reported by the use of ICG worldwide are extremely low. I mean, we're talking about less, uh, uh, way less than 1%. In any case, if you don't want to take any risks, there are some uh, companies that does produce uh, ICG without uh, iodine, but the cost actually tend to increase. Uh, what is uh, uh, how does it work? We mentioned already. Uh, basically, you need to give the patient a little amount of ICG, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.3 milligram per kilos. Uh, that means that usually uh, you, you you give the patient two or three cc of a diluted uh, ICG. Uh, IV or locally, depending for where you're going to uh, use the ICG and the fluorescent uh, with. Once it's in the bloodstream, uh, the ICG links to the uh, protein of the plasma protein. And, uh, uh, sorry, uh, links to the plasma protein. And uh, once the, um, uh, the uh, ICG is completely um, uh, is in the in the bloodstream uh, that you can excite the ICG. How you can excite it? Well, basically you use a, a, fo a form of uh, excitement. Most of the uh, company they do use uh, uh, near infrared light uh, that is able to uh, um, take the electron in the inner orbit and put in the outside outer orbit. It. And when the electron goes back, it releases energy in photofluorescence. Or um, another possibility is to use a laser beam uh, or a mixture of laser beam and near infrared light. Doing that, uh, you need then a camera that is able to pick up uh, the fluorescence that uh, you uh, that the ICG produced and uh, transmit the image to a screen that is the same screen that you use uh, in laparoscopic surgery or a screen for laparoscopic surgery. So it's a very uh, easy uh, technology that allow um, the surgeon to receive this kind of information. In it's also a, a technology that uh, it doesn't really bankrupt your hospital. It's not an expensive technology, especially in the field of laparoscopic surgery. Most of the companies that produce this system for fluorescence, they will trade in your previous system and they will give you a special price for the end of the, your production. So in terms also of cost, it's a very easy and not expensive technology. There are different companies that does produce a, a system for open surgery. And nowadays, every single company that does produce uh, system for laparoscopic surgery, they do have uh, a near infrared uh, or uh, a fluorescence uh, a module or a fluorescence equipment. Storz, Olympus, uh, Novadak and Stryker that they recently uh, merged, so we're going to have one single company that produce it. And needless to say, of course, even intuitive and the robotic system with the last version, the X and XI, they do have a module to perform fluorescence gadi surgery even in a robotic uh, uh, surgery. Uh, my forecast when I talk to different companies that uh, in the next few years probably you will not have a, a system that is sold without uh, the uh, ICG uh, mode. 
this is the system that I mainly use during my uh, my experience uh, that has been going on for more than eight years nowadays, uh, and it's the one by Car Storz, very similar to the system that I just show you. Uh, basically, as you can see, you have the, your stack, you have a camera that is a slightly different camera that allows to detect the fluorescence. You have a foot pedal that allows you to switch from near infrared light to standard light. The scope is more or less the same. It does have a filter at the end of the scope in order to uh, pick up the fluorescence. But what is really new of the system is this, is the near infrared light source. Uh, this is a light source that by using a foot pedal or by, in the last version, by using the bottom and the top of the camera, is able to switch your view, your light from standard white light to near infrared light. So it's a quite a straightforward uh, uh, situation. So the talk, uh, these are the general principle. As you saw, is a very straightforward technology. It doesn't really require too much uh, information. I always say to the people and the company that really is, is, is a technology that is basically have a zero learning curve time. You know, you see the system a couple of times and then once you have clear how much ICG to give it, when to give AICG, then the machine itself doesn't require any uh, a specific uh, uh, capability or uh, knowledge in order to be used. So the talk is going to talk about uh, the perfusion of organ and, and I'm going to talk mainly about solid organ and of course the one of the major solid organ that we have in the in the uh, human body is the, uh, the liver. Uh, the, the application of ICG uh, for liver surgery are definitely quite wide, but are still under uh, studies because um, uh, we have, uh, especially when we're dealing with the cancer, uh, we have different kind of uh, tumor, uh, different histopathological uh, tumor. We have primary tumor, we have metastasis, we have the cholangiocarcinoma. And we have a lot of benign lesion. And uh, all these things um, determine that uh, you really have to, uh, you have a different partner uh, of uh, ICG visualization uh, when uh, uh, you will have, uh, when you inject ICG to this patient. I would say that uh, most of the studies that have been performed today are related to the use of ICG for uh, uh, identifying and detecting liver metastasis. But the other center, uh, and this is my mainly my most of my experience, but other center they also develop and uh, and then define the use of ICG for cholangiocarcinoma or for a cellular uh, carcinoma, even in a cervical patient. There is a sort of, um, if you read the literature, you will see that there are different uh, aspects of the liver lesion, accord, a fluorescent aspect of the liver lesion, according to the type of tumor that you're going to uh, deal with. Um, as I mentioned, there are also differences between the same type of tumor and the aspect that the tumor has according to the differentiation of the, uh, of the cancer. This is an interesting um, uh, study coming from uh, from Japan, and they analyzed the different fluorescent panel uh, of uh, uh, primary hepatocellular carcinoma according to the degree of differentiation. And as you can see, if you have a well differentiated uh, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, you have a very nice uh, uh, homogeneous fluorescent lesion. If uh, the differentiation tends to be reduced, you do have uh, a reduction of the uh, of the fluorescent uh, that you can have uh, on the tumor itself. And uh, the, the most important and uh, the one that I have most experience is liver metastasis, uh, and I will come to this uh, in a minute. When you have liver metastasis, you have a, a, a sort of halo uh, sign, you have a, a rim of fluorescence that uh, is uh, basically defined the margin of your liver uh, metastasis. Uh, this is a, an example, I hope that you can see uh, the video that I'm showing you uh, now. This is a case of a segment four liver metastasis. As you can see here, you can detect very nicely the liver metastasis. This is, was a metastasis that was partially uh, deep into the parenchyma. Uh, it's partially superficial and partially deep. What do you see on this liver metastasis though is not uh, the uh, tumor itself, but it's the uh, normal cell that are located around the tumor. This is a laparoscopic uh, metastasectomy, as you can see. And um, what you see, fluorescent, in case of liver metastasis, are not the metastatic cell itself, are the normal cell around the tumor. Why it's so? 
Well, it's very simple because uh, um, when you want to use uh, uh, fluorescence guided surgery for liver metastasis and you identification, you need to inject the ICG at least 48 hours before. Even better if you, in, uh, if you give the ICG a 36 hour before surgery. Uh, in this case, uh, the ICG goes into the bloodstream, goes into the bile and goes outside uh, the liver. Uh, and you want to have the liver that is completely without ICG. What happened that the normal cell, so not the cancer cell, but the normal cell uh, around the liver metastasis, they cannot excrete bile. So they do retain the ICG around in, in their, in their uh, cytoplasm. So what happened is that you have uh, the lesion, the metastasis, that is the one dark that you see here, and you have the normal cell around the tumor that are fluorescent. This is uh, uh, another example. So let's come to, uh, this is a larger uh, lesion uh, on segment six. And as you can see here, it's a superficial lesion and a deep lesion as well. And as you can see here, of course, you need to check the margin as well with intraoperative uh, uh, ultrasonography. But in this case, you don't need ICG to identify the, the metastasis because it's clearly visible. But you can use the ICG during surgery to identify the safe margin and the safe resection margin. Of course, this can be done also with uh, um, endoscopic ultrasound, but require a lot of expertise. They require quite a bit of time. And with ICG, you have a visual identification of the correct margin of the lesion. Uh, another uh, example, this is a case of uh, a patient that uh, had uh, a colonic resection a few years before, and then it developed uh, two lesions. One was on segment six. It was a very superficial lesion, as you can see here, a tiny little mark over there. Okay, and as you can see, there is a rim of fluorescence around the tumor. Okay, that's all still superficial and easy to see. The patient had another uh, deeper uh, metastasis on segment seven, and that was much more difficult uh, to, to be identified. And probably, I'm not so sure if you can see, because I can see from my video, there was a, just a tiny little um, uh, amount of fluorescence in the deeper into the segment seven that was confirmed using uh, uh, interoperative ultrasound. And that is one, show you one of the limits that the ICG does have. Uh, when you want to identify liver metastasis or liver tumor, that the depth of penetration of the current system is not good enough for deeper located vision. So if the lesion is up to one, 1.5 centimeter deeper into the parenchyma, you can see the fluorescence. But if it's deeper than that, you will not be able to see nothing. I think that is just a pure technical problem that will probably be sorted in the future where we'll have new um, camera, new system for ICG, and maybe even new dye that release better, uh, higher uh, degree of fluorescence. Needless to say that you can use ICG also in open surgery. Uh, that is an example that is done with the same system, the stored system that we have. There are systems for uh, uh, liver surgery that are, are done for open surgery that they are able to release a much stronger uh, amount of, uh, a higher amount of uh, near infrared light and are able to detect uh, better fluorescence, even tiny little amount of fluorescence. That's are done for liver surgery and are open and they actually they works very well. This is just to show you another example, liver mats after the resection that was done with the system from, uh, from Stryker, just to give you an example. Um, we did publish a, a, you know, a, a, a small review recently with Gianluca Baiocchi from Brescia and Michele Diana from uh, Strasbourg in order to identify the different clinical applications in liver surgery. As I say, we are very, really, really in the infancy of uh, ICG Florence and surgery uh, in for cancer uh, detection. And uh, as you can see, there are some limitations. Depth penetration is one. False positive is another uh, limitation, especially when you deal with cirrhotic patient. You can see very nicely in this image, you know, when you have a, a heavily cirrhotic patient, you have a, a, a lot of retention of ICG, even if you, uh, if you uh, inject the ICG way before surgery. Uh, another um, possibility of ICG during liver surgery is just to uh, inject the ICG when you perform the extrahepatic uh, um, uh, 
bleeding control uh, before performing resection. They will give you the demarcation of uh, the uh, liver parenchyma. Uh, in this case, you, you, you ligate, uh, first uh, you isolate and you ligate the vessel outside the liver parenchyma, then you clamp temporarily, you give an injection IV, peripheral injection of IV, and you can actually be sure that you have a, a, a disconnected all the blood vessels that were going into the uh, liver parenchyma before performing the liver resection. So this is another uh, application. Another application, if uh, uh, you want, is to study the anatomy of the blood vessel. That is an example. That is a, a, a left lateral uh, sec, um, sectinectomy uh, that we perform. We were, we were not sure about the anatomy uh, of the uh, blood vessel before we were performing the liver resection. As, as you can see, once we dissected a little bit the item, we asked the, the anesthetist to give an injection of ICG, and immediately we have an angiography and identification of the blood vessel before performing the resection. Another possibility is to identify biliary leak. This is a, another uh, example. After a, a liver resection, we were cleaning up the, the, the stump and we identify this tiny little uh, river, as I call, of ICG coming out from the liver uh, due to a, a superficial uh, lesion of a superficial duct that could be uh, repaired using a fibro. Uh, Bicryl, uh, in order to avoid to have a post operative by leaks. So, uh, in, um, in liver surgery, definitely after uh, you perform the liver resection, you always want to have a good view of your uh, the margin of your resection in order to identify tiny little um, bile uh, leaks that are easy to identify using ICG and sometimes are not so easy to be identified during surgery. And even if you have to reoperate the patient because of a, of a big bileoma, uh, the use of ICG helps you to identify the duct that are leaking and then you can take care of them. Another, uh, of course, solid organ, one of the major solid organs, is pancreatic surgery. If we are at the very beginning uh, of the uh, indication of liver surgery, of um, uh, fluorescence guided surgery for liver surgery, we are even uh, more at the beginning for pancreatic surgery. What is the limit of the pancreatic surgery? Um, is that uh, pancreas is a highly vascularized uh, organs. There are some tumors that uh, have a higher uh, vascularization and they retain ICG more than other tumor of the uh, of the pancreas, uh, more than the adenocarcinoma, and these are neuroendocrine tumor. And uh, there are some study out there, very at the beginning, that um, uh, demonstrated like the use of ICG can help the surgeon, especially doing laparoscopic surgery where you don't have your tactile feedback, to identify even deeper located uh, neuroendocrine tumor because they look, as you can see from this image, uh, more uh, perfuse than, uh, um, uh, than the standard tissue. This is a, an example that we did. There was a, a, a spleen preserving uh, a distal pancreatectomy for a, a metastatic uh, um, for a metastatic uh, um, uh, lesion. Uh, sorry, for a neuroendocrine uh, tumor. And uh, as you can see here, we were given an injection of ICG. And as you can see, the endocrine lesion over here it did retain ICG more than the rest the rest of the parenchyma. This is just an example to show you how can you can. Uh, uh, use this kind of, uh, of technique to identify lesions that are hypervascularized. And uh, it can be quite interesting in the future, especially if we come out with better camera or maybe a new dye that will actually more uh, specifically design for pancreatic surgery. Uh, here are the examples, especially for multiple small neuroendocrine tumor. Maybe this is going to be extremely helpful in order to define the limit of your resection. These small uh, neuroendocrine tumor are very difficult to be identified using standard endoscopic ultrasound because they are multiple and the, the, the diameter is extremely small. What about uh, the use for uh, nephrectomy? Well, here we can have a different kind of use of ICG. One is just to identify uh, the anatomy. This is a case of living donor nephrectomy, laparoscopic living donor nephrectomy. And as you can see, if you want to be sure, especially by the location of the uh, renal artery, you can use ICG. You can see this, uh, the renal vein is quite clearly evident uh, and was already dissected. The renal artery is always behind the renal vein and sometimes gets very strange uh, position. So you can just simply ask the uh, anesthetist to inject ICG. You can see here behind the suction there is the kidney and the aorta over here and the uh, start of the renal artery is just behind the renal vein that gets fluorescent as well. So I think that can be a good help 
doing living donor uh, nephrectomy. This is a, another example or another, it is a right-sided living donor nephrectomy. We're not sure where the, uh, the uh, renal artery was. We already surrounded the renal vein. We asked the, uh, the anesthetist to give a shot of ICG and immediately were able to identify the main renal artery uh, just behind the renal vein uh, at this level. And of course, you can use this also for identifying accessory artery that sometimes can be a problem for uh, the surgeon who will live in donor nephrectomy. You can also use uh, for partial nephrectomy. This is uh, an example of a small tumor on the upper pole of the spleen. Uh, in this case, the use of um, uh, fluorescence surgery is uh, extremely uh, interesting in order to identify the perfusion of the organ. As you can see here, first of all, we were able to identify the tumor that as often happened during uh, um, doing for a um, uh, renal tumor, they tend to be hypovascularized in comparison to the rest of the parenchyma. But the most important thing is that when we start dissecting the ilum, and you, we wanted to identify if these were the vessels that should be ligated in order to obtain a, a partial nephrectomy and a bloodless uh, or partially bloodless uh, um, uh, nephrectomy, what we did, we isolate the vessel, we close temporarily the vessel with a vascular clamp. We give it a shot on ICG. And as you can see here, you can nicely identify the margin of your resection. And then you can, of course, uh, uh, clip with the uh, hemolock or with others, clip uh, your uh, the blood vessel that you isolate. And you can start to perform the resection along the margin that you were sure that you were identifying for the uh, ICG. As you can see here, we can check again after putting the clip. OK, there is still some. Uh, fluorescence left from the first injection, new injection, main renal artery gets fluorescent, parenchyma gets fluorescent, but now the area of the tumor, it gets ischemic and you can start to do your partial nephrectomy starting from this level. Uh, another interesting application in kidney surgery is not only the living donor, but is also the kidney perfusion after, transplanta after transplantation. This is the same patient as before. We perform the renal uh, transplantation. Uh, we attach the, uh, the, rain, uh, the vein and the artery, and we want to check if the kidney was uh, homogeneous perfused. And as you can see, here we go, we have a good perfusion of our graft. Of course, this can apply also to liver transplantation. I don't do any liver transplantation, so uh, I don't have any information on that, but definitely can be applied on liver transplantation. You can see the, the kidney, but not only the kidney, the most important part for me was the ureter. It's always difficult to, uh, to know if the ureter is well perfused. So what we can do with ICG, we can actually check the perfusion before performing the ureter bladder anastomosis that sometimes can leak and the leakage most of the time is related to an ischemia of the ureter. And as you can see here, it takes a little bit of a time in comparison to the bowel because we're dealing with very small vessels. But in this specific case, you can identify very nicely the fluorescence coming up from the top, going down towards the end of uh, the uh, ureter. But this part, this distal part that looks perfectly fine on standard light, it was ischemic. So as you can see here, once again, we can decide that we're going to use this part of the ureter to perform the anastomosis and cutting the distal part in order to avoid a leakage of, uh, of urine uh, in the post-operative course. And this kind of patient that are usually immunopressed is always a problem. What about adrenalectomy? I noticed that you have a session on the webinar of a focus on endocrine surgery, so we'll go very, very quickly. And there are a lot of, uh, uh, of paper now there that demonstrate how you can actually identify uh, the uh, adrenal tumor for the same principle that we saw at the level of the uh, of the pancreas, because most of the renal, adrenal tumor are hypervascular, hypoperfused, so you can identify them uh, during surgery. I think this is extremely important, uh, and there are some evidence in the literature, also, especially for when you're doing a parenchymal sparing uh, adrenalectomy, that is something that is quite uh, um, fashion nowadays to spare the adrenal, but especially when you're dealing with benign lesion, you want to have the patient with left with some adrenal, so you want to identify the tumor rather than the, the, the the good adrenal part, and that can be easy done uh, during surgery. I did have uh, a use uh, as well. We did use uh, in a case, uh, for instance, where we were dealing with a quite large mass 
uh, of right adrenal uh, renal gland and we would like to know exactly where the renal uh, the main renal vein that is goes into the uh, in the into the vena cava was and then, so we ask the same principle the anesthetist to inject a little bit of icg as you can see the vena cava became very very um, uh, fluorescent but we were able to identify the area of a, a large fluorescence between the adrenal gland and the vena cava that was corresponding to the main uh, adrenal vein and so we were able to identify and to dissect as you can see the adrenal vein over here corresponding to the area of the fluorescence of course it's not uh, an ideal uh, uh, application because everything gets very fluorescent but actually in some cases it does it did help us uh, quite uh, significantly what about the spleen? Well, here you can actually use the spleen one to identify the anatomy of uh, this, uh, this splenic uh, vessel. This is an example, this is a quite fat uh, patient that had to remove uh, uh, the spleen. As you can see here, we have uh, the usual uh, distal uh, uh, artery that actually can be clipped and, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, divided. And then where we're going to go, and I will move a little bit faster, where we have to go to the main uh, uh, splenic artery. Uh, we were not sure where this was because it was covered by the, a lot of fatty tissue. So we asked the anesthetist to give an ICG shot and very quickly within 20 seconds, we have the definition and the location of the main, uh, 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 the main uh, splenic uh, artery. This is a, uh, an example of a splenic artery hanoid uh, this is uh, when uh, we try to resect uh, uh, electively the splenic artery aneurysm, trying to leave the spleen in place in order to avoid uh, uh, a splenectomy. So we isolated uh, the, the vessel that were actually feeding the splenic artery. We resect completely, we, we remove it, and then uh, we immediately realized that the spleen was not really well perfused as it was uh, uh, before. So we check with the, the perfusion, we give a shot of ICG, and as you notice, we just have a an upper pole perfuse, probably by the, uh, of course, by the uh, short gastric vessel, but 90% of the spleen was actually ischemic, so we decided to remove it. What about uh, thoracic surgery? Here we are very at the beginning uh, of the experience uh, of uh, um, uh, Florence gastric surgery for thoracic surgery, and I mean for lung uh, resection. But here there are a lot of studies um, by using a new dye, not ICG, in order to identify very small tumor of the lung. And there is, a, um, there is a new dye that is under investigation uh, uh, in the United States that is able to be uh, identifying, to link specifically with cancer cell. So it's very likely that in the, in the future we're going to have uh, the possibility to guide our uh, resection also under fluorescence guidance. So in the conclusion, I think that I, I tried to show you with this uh, quick uh, presentation how uh, ICG uh, fluorescence and ICG surgery is really effective to, to help to increase your visualization during laparoscopic and open surgery, of course. Uh, the technique is really easy. Uh, doesn't require any learning curve. You can replicate as much as possible. Everybody can do it and is most of the time it's 100% success rate. Uh, ICG itself, as I mentioned, is an extremely uh, safe uh, dye, uh, fluorophore. Uh, it's been out there for a long time, so you can use it without any, any problem. It's definitely cost effective. I didn't enter into the, 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 the matter of the cost because the, the cost of the dye vario is very variable by country and also the system can vary, but definitely it's a cost effective technique. Uh, as you can see, the liver surgeon can use it, the pancreatic surgeon can use it, the kidney surgeon can use it, the thoracic surgery. And on top of that, you had all the general surgery application like, uh, you know, bowel resection, uh, large bowel. And uh, so it's really a multidisciplinary uh, uh, possible clinical application, uh, especially in the field of lap coli and in the field of perfusion of, uh, of the bowel. It may have some medical legal repercussion in, in the future. And, um, and I think that the future, as we saw for lung surgery, but not only for lung surgery, will be the tumor targeting uh, uh, using fluorescent agent. And I think that will be really uh, the key to personalize the, uh, the surgical procedure to increase the safety and the precision of the surgery itself. And uh, this is my hospital, this is my team, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Bonnie, for that wonderful presentation. We have got lots of questions in, so we'll try and get through as many as we can in the time we have. So our first question here um, is, 
what is the rate of sensitivity if the technique is in liver tumours? Is there any different in cirrhotic livers? Does that question make sense? Sorry, can, can you repeat the question? Because I, I had to put my uh, volume down. Oh, apologies. Um, so the question is, um, what is the rate of sensitivity if the technique is in liver tumours? Is there any difference in cirrhotic livers? Yeah, well, thank you very much. for This is an, an interesting question. This is a, one of the limits. Um, uh, the, um, the sensitivity is not so high at the moment because we are dealing with different kind of tumour. We are different. We are dealing with different kind of uh, uh, liver. Uh, so, and, and most of, one of the the problem that I had in my experience uh, is uh, to discriminate, for instance, uh, simple uh, angiomas from tumour, uh, because uh, also angiomas can create uh, the retention of ICG. So, at the moment, I think uh, the uh, possibility and the sensitivity uh, of this uh, um, uh, of this technique is quite high, but the specificity is quite low because you have a lot of false uh, negative and uh, there are some patients that you actually really they works very well uh, you give the icg two days before surgery then you do surgery you can identify the tumor nicely there's uh, some other patient uh, that where the liver function maybe is a bit different the metabolism and uh, uh, is a bit different uh, and then you have a lot of false positive because you have a lot of retention of icg so it's very difficult to identify so at the moment i think we're still as i mentioned at the infancy we need to gain a little bit more experience uh, and probably Although ICG works very well, uh, probably we are not using the uh, the best possible uh, uh, devices, especially in laparoscopic surgery, because in open surgery there are a lot of different uh, uh, cameras that are out there that give you a very good imaging, even for deeper located uh, lesion. Uh, but I think now we're still actually working on that. Thank you very much. And um, our next question here is, um, oh, it's a two-part question, is there, what is the dose of ICG that you recommend for liver tumours and pancreatic tumours? And secondly, is there any difference between colorectal metastases and primary tumours? Okay, so uh, I start from the last one because it's the easiest one. Well, big difference. Uh, the, the primary tumor, most of the time, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and even cholangiocarcinoma, they look like a, 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 a uniform fluorescent nodule. Okay. Um, on the contrary, uh, when you have a metastasis, usually you have an halo image. You have a rim of fluorescence around the tumor. And remember that the rim is not the tumor itself. But the rim are the normal cell uh, around the metastatic lesion. So this is why um, you, you, you can use uh, the fluorescence in order to identify the, the clear margin of your resection. And in terms of, uh, of dosing, um, this is a, a good field of research because uh, nobody really ever studied nicely uh, the metabolism and uh, the, the, the quantity of ICG uh, that you need to give to a patient to identify and to get the fluorescence. My impression is that we are overdosing the patient in any application, even for lap coli, for bowel perfusion, any that's include also um, the uh, user in uh, in, uh, uh, in liver. When I say overdosing without any side effect for the patient, but I think we, we really need a little bit of ICG to obtain uh, a good fluorescence. So uh, I usually give the patient 2 cc uh, of ICG. I give shot of 2 cc of ICG diluted uh, with, with, with 25 milligram diluted in 10 uh, ml of uh, water or sterile water. And I give this uh, uh, two days before surgery in case of liver resection, and I give it uh, during the surgery, during the surgical procedure for the pancreatic uh, resection, because uh, uh, it's a two different uh, uh, visualization. Uh, one actually is related to the hypoperfused nodule, that is pancreatic surgery, and uh, on the other hand, for liver, you must want to know you want to have the retention of ICG within the tumor or outside the tumor, depending if it's primary or metastatic. So you want to have the rest of the liver completely dark and not fluorescent at all. But uh, my experience uh, in every kind of surgery that I use ICG, I tend to, with 
the more experience I had, I tend to give less and less ICG because I can get the, the fluorescence as well. And if you don't give too much ICG, you can repeat the injection as well. Thank you very much. Um, a question I think is probably linked to that as well. Um, with regards to the intravenous injection, what's the optimal concentration of ICG to assess colon perfusion? Oh, for colon perfusion, uh, once again, is uh, once again, I think 0 0.1, 0 0.2 uh, uh, milligram per kilos. If you want really to calculate uh, the the dosage per kilos, uh, once again, um, I usually get uh, because that's had to be done by the anesthetist. I don't want to upset the anesthetist too much. You want to have his his, uh, his job as quick and easy as possible. So what we use, we get we have a 25 milligrams uh, uh, ICG vial. We dilute with 10 ml, and uh, we give uh, for bowel perfusion. We give uh, two cc of ICG I IV, and that works very well for any patient. Fat or thin, uh, it works very well. Is a pure angiography, and if you give two cc uh, very quickly, you can actually you have the removal of ICG from the uh, from the from the bowel, and then you can re-inject afterwards. Because I usually check the uh, the perfusion before. Uh, once I cut the mesentery, before I put the embryo of the stapler, and then uh, I put, I perform the anastomosis, and before I close completely my stapler, I check again because I want to see if there is any influence of the of the tension of the anastomosis. So I check again the perfusion, and then finally, uh, if the, I'm doing a, a rectal or low uh, left uh, colonic resection, I also check the perfusion intra. Uh, uh, endoscopically, uh, in order to see uh, the mucosa side as well. But I give 2 cc with 10 uh, min, uh, milliliter of sterile water. Thank you. So, um, listening to that response there um, fits in with another question we have um, asking, is there any difference on, on the perfusion that you use depending on the organ that you want to evaluate? No, no. Uh, the, the the dosage and and the, and the uh, dosage and the uh, concentration is always the same. Um, I don't change it uh, at all at the moment. I don't think that there are evidence that changing the dosage actually will give you a different kind of uh, uh, visualization. Um, as you as you uh, as probably people know, um, the fluorescence can reach a peak. After that, uh, you you can give even more, but you you don't actually have an improvement on the quantity on the fluorescence you can ever uh, pick up because there is a sort of saturation of the fluorescence that you can obtain. So basically, you don't really uh, you don't really need uh, uh, to uh, worry about uh, to give too much ICG. My suggestion and my impression is really that we are we, we used to, especially in the past, give. The, patient too much ICG, uh, but uh, the less we give, the better it is because uh, uh, we can actually then use it again and we don't stain the organ uh, with ICG that tend to get uh, and keep a sort of background fluorescence after you use the ICG once. Thank you very much. And um, being very conscious of everyone's time, we'll just take a couple of more questions before we end today's webinar. Um, question here. You were talking about the different um, perfusions that you use. Do you know if the different equipments that are available have an impact on the dose that's required? Well, um, I'm not so sure that they have an impact of the dosage that you um, require, uh, but I definitely uh, they have an impact on the visualization. In general, and that is common uh, and obvious, uh, open surgery uh, equipment uh, are able to uh, uh, identify a, uh, the fluorescence better than laparoscopic. And it's a question of sensitivity of the camera and also the amount of uh, energy that they deliver in order to obtain the fluorescence. So that is a matter of fact. If Even in the field of laparoscopic equipment, uh, there are different kinds of visualization. There are some systems that tend to give you not a better, flor better fluorescence visualization, but probably they're able to give you a better background image. Uh, there are some systems that actually the background image is really, really dark, and you just see the fluorescence part. There are some other systems that are able to uh, compensate artificially, of course, using the camera, and, uh, and give you a good background uh, image and the fluorescence image as well. And then there are systems like Novadac that basically they merge 
the, the standard light system with the fluorescence and they actually merge it together in order to have a superimposed image. But I don't think that the system are, uh, as far as I know, uh, the system are not related to the, they don't different you know, according to the, uh, to the dosage, but definitely they can give you different kind of image. In fact, for liver surgery, especially for deeply located uh, lesion, definitely the open surgery uh, device that uh, they give you a much better image than the fluoroscopic one. Thank you very much. And moving to our final question for today. Um, do you consider that this technology will become a standard of care? Oh, uh, well, uh, there is a bit of conflict of interest, but I think uh, uh, because uh, I'm presenting a, a, a webinar on Florida, but my, my impression is not my impression only, uh, is that, that definitely would be a standard of care. Would be would be a tool that you have in your camera. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to talk, especially for the laparoscopic system, uh, we're not going to talk about a system without ICG uh, module uh, or possibility anymore in the future. And um, and for open surgery, I think that that will have a lot of potential. It will be standard of care, especially when the new fluorophore will come out, because uh, the, the future of fluorescence guided surgery will definitely is going to be uh, on the uh, tumor identification, the real-time tumor identification. that can be done uh, with ICG or with other uh, fluorophore, but definitely all of them, they're basically, um, the, the principle is to link the, the fluorescent agent with uh, some sort of antibodies that actually is able to identify the tumor or a sort of marker that is able to identify specific marker that are in the tumor as well. So definitely, for my, for my view, it will be a standard of care, yes if it's not already for some procedure. Thank you very much, Dr. Bonnie, for your presentation. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Once you leave the webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation. It's just a couple of really quick questions and we would appreciate it if you could complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 hours, which will include a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Diagnostic Green and ISFGS and our presenter, Dr. Bonnie, thank you so much for joining us and please do enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you.